Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. State Superintendent of Public Instruction Jillian Balow is beginning the third year of her first elected term and Wyoming Chronicle sits down with the superintendent to understand the challenges ahead for education in Wyoming and also the successes that her department has achieved. Superintendent Jillian Balow, next on Wyoming Chronicle. State Superintendent of Public Instruction Jillian Balow was elected to office in 2014. Madam Superintendent, you've served two years of that term, ready for your third. Welcome to, and thanks for visiting with us on Wyoming Chronicle. Thank you, Craig. I want to start out with what a lot of people in the state are talking about right now, and it's the future of education. Um, you've obviously now had two years in office, but times are changing for sure, and relative to funding in particular. There's a lot of um, wheels that are turning right now mm -hmm. as far as the future of education in Wyoming. What are your thoughts as we speak today um, on um, the need for Wyoming to contemplate its future relative to education? Yeah, you know, uh, historically, and it continues to be true, uh, education is a priority in, in Wyoming and certainly at the national level. Um, in Wyoming, we've made some really wise decisions about our investments in education, as well as how we've set up our programming infrastructure for students to receive a quality education in Wyoming. I don't think that's lost on anyone, um, and, and certainly not lost in the conversations about education finance, um, which is why it, it is such a, a grappling and, and difficult conversation to have. A lot of other states, uh, their go-to is to cut education funding and then cut it some more. Uh, this is such a difficult conversation and decision in Wyoming because it is a priority and it's not just about cutting education. It's about ensuring that our students continue to have a quality quality education and, uh, and, and also recognizing our revenue and economic picture in our state. Certainly with the budget shortfalls that are talked about now being discussed, as we've said before, in the billions of dollars, mm -hmm. not just in the hundreds of billions mm -hmm. of dollars. You've contemplated um, what should be done in the future, but you've asked this legislature to maybe hold the phone just a little bit and not jump to any fixes in this session. Is that still your what you're thinking today? It is. Look, we've we've spent over a decade building building out a world class funding model for education. Um, we have seen great payoffs for our students and for our state. Um, we we don't want to. We don't want to jeopardize that by making hasty decisions uh, with, with cuts to our funding model. So what I've proposed and what I've asked the legislature to do is we know we have to look at the funding model, but let's do it outside of the 40-day legislative session where we have a, a, a greater opportunity for educators and for citizens to weigh in on the topic and, um, and it's not crunched, so to speak, within a legislative session. That being said, I also recognize that there need to be some cuts that are made immediately to education and some new revenue infusions uh, made to education to really get us through this biennium and the next biennium. And so um, I've also, in addition to asking the legislature not to make hasty decisions about our funding model, asked them to look at a series of about eight different recommended uh, revenue infusions, cuts, uh, realizing some additional savings, and, uh, and, and, and it's, it's good to see that some of those have translated into bills. Some of them have even found their way into a, a larger bill, bill that we're calling the omnibus bill. Um, and those would realize uh, some immediate savings, some immediate revenue that sits outside of that funding model um, and, and is, is perhaps less detrimental to student learning. I want to talk about that omnibus bill yep. just for a moment as we're Great. taping this. It's less than, or just a little more than 12 hours old yes. um, from, from when we've all seen it for the first time. It talks about student-teacher ratios increasing. It talks about cuts in administrator salaries. It talks about um, cuts in transportation. It talks about um, continuing with a 1.4% decrease in funding for education. Are all of these things, that, um, Madam Superintendent, things you're not supporting right now? Are these things that you believe can wait? 
or are these things that some of these things do you believe can actually move forward in this session? So I think that, that, that it's a really important conversation to have during the session. But, um, but frankly, most of the things that you just mentioned are directly inside of our funding model and the result of some wise investments that we've made in education. Um, that is where I think we need to hold the phone, so to speak, take some time and really think about the decisions that we're making and, um, and, and go after this um, less with an ax and, and more with just some diligent minds and some thoughtful decisions around education. Funding. Some legislators may respond that mm -hmm. they published a white paper in the mm -hmm. end of December and received over 600 comments mm -hmm. um, that said, you know what, we need to take a look at instructional facilitators. We need to take a look at administrators' salaries. They might tell you that really the public's starting to speak on these things to the extent that we can do some of the cutting now. Do you still believe not enough public input has been um, asked for relative to these issues? Well, I think public input changes over time as as the as decisions are being made. Um, I think the omnibus bill, again, serves as a really great catalyst for conversation during the session. I also think that it's an important contingency should the state not be able to reach consensus during a super committee interim uh, or an interim super committee um, or a special session if that was needed. Um, it's a, the, the omnibus bill is, is a good contingency. So some people might be wondering, well, when, when is the drop dead time for when decisions have to be mm -hmm. made in your mind? Mm -hmm. In the omnibus bill, um, the super committee wouldn't be organized until 2018. Is that mm -hmm. too late? That is, and, and I actually have wondered if that 2018 was a typo, if that's actually supposed to be 2017. I would like to see that convened sooner than later. Um, this, this process of looking at our school funding model is nothing new. Uh, it, it, we, we review it every several years through what's called a recalibration process, and really the process wouldn't look any different than the recalibration process. Certainly the decisions made would be, but again, what I would like to see is some kind of decision during this legislative session to make some cuts outside of the school funding model and have the omnibus, omnibus bill be a contingency if there aren't some hard decisions that are made during the 2017 interim. I want to read you a quote that Senator Chris Rothfuss um, gave just in the last few days about the model. He said, we have a really good model. It's been proven to be successful. We should try to stick to it and identify new revenue streams, both internal and through additional taxation. Yeah. Everyone believes that new revenues must be a part of this mm -hmm. solution. Madam Superintendent, have you thought about that and, and what those new revenues should be? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I have given some thought, and of course I don't have um, anything more than a voice in the process. Um, I don't have a vote in the process. Um, but but here's, here's what we need to be careful of, and another reason that this work really needs to be done during the interim versus the legislative session. Um, as we realize new revenue streams or find new revenue streams, we have to make sure of two things. Number one, that the burden isn't too great on the people, um, also known as a tax increase. And number two, that, um, that the burden isn't too great on our general fund because there is a push-pull that has to take place to find new revenue streams and that may come out of our general fund that would affect other state operations. And it needs to be done very carefully and very thoughtfully. Um, our legislature, uh, you know, has, has a whole lot of, of issues to deal with outside of education funding um, and, and outside of education in general. Uh, I don't think one issue is more important. Certainly this rules the day because it is so massive, but it is also very important to, um, to realize that, that our legislators have a full plate and, um, and, and this is a great time to just slow down and make some decisions that, uh, that don't have unintended consequences. A couple of, um, more questions relative <clears throat> to this issue and then we'll move on. You and I both attended a meeting that Mike O'Donnell mm -hmm. um, um, hosted and he is the uh, state's counsel for school finance. Mm -hmm. He said during that meeting that using general fund monies was a no-no, to quote him, um, to support education. And also in the omnibus bill, um, there's a concept of, of taking $100 million a year from the, mm -hmm. lizard, the late legislative stabilization reserve account to help support education. Your thoughts on both of those issues, is taking $100 million a year from the LISRA account or from the rainy day fund mm -hmm. now a good idea in your view? Oh, you know, savings will eventually dry up, Craig. And, um, and so- And I should looking, point out that yes. if they do, then a half percent sales tax 
if that LISRA account that mm -hmm. falls below $500 million would then be um, come into play in this bill as it stands. Right, right. I, th I think it is a, a slippery slope to depend on utilizing savings and depend on a tax increase to fund education. Um, you know, I, I appreciate all of the thought that the legislators across the board are um, are sharing around this issue. Um, at the end of the day, I think that there do need to be some changes made to the model. Um, I think we can efficiently and successfully continue to fund education, continue to make wise investments, and do three things. First of all, find savings. Second of all, find efficiencies. And third of all, find revenue streams. Um, that will come at a reduced a reduced cost for education. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, we need to adjust the funding model so that we are not spending as much on education, uh, but still maintaining it as a priority and still prioritizing those wise investments that we've made. Um, you know, uh, when when Mike O'Donnell spoke about uh, about not using general funds, about um, about realizing savings and, and tapping into the rainy day, uh, I don't think anyone sees those those as viable long-term solutions um, without a lot of public input leading up to that. So clear away all the clouds, yep. Superintendent. What today is your role now in this, this massive issue that sits before the, ed, the K-12 education right. in Wyoming, of which you're the state superintendent. Right. What is your role today? You know, again, um, I don't have a vote in the process. Um, my, my agency and my work um, is really the, the uh, is tasked with the responsibility of operationalizing what the legislature decides. But as state superintendent, I think it's very important to have a leadership voice in this and, um, and other issues in education. So, so my role is to advocate for the state of Wyoming, advocate for schools, and try to find that balance um, somewhere in between. And, um, and again, uh, you know, that, that voice of advocacy tells me, um, the voice of advocacy for the state says, we've got to make some changes to the funding model. That voice of advocacy for schools says, we need to keep this as far away from classrooms as we possibly can. And so it's a constant um, balance in finding that. And, and really, it's, it's working in collaboration with all of the different partners in education and with our legislature to find um, a viable and, um, and long-term solution, but also some, some, some short-term fixes that help get us through the next couple of bienniums without tapping into our rainy day account or without tapping into our general fund too much, but most of all, keeping it away from the classroom. Do you believe then, if we sit here two years, four years, six years from now, <clears throat> what do you think we can still say about Wyoming's education? You just received great news recently mm -hmm. that that Wyoming, by some accounts, is as high as seventh in the country. Do you think that relative to this pressure on budget, that we'll still be able to say that? Yeah, you know, um, I'm, I'm going to actually predicate that with a couple of uh, a couple of notions that I had coming into this office two years ago, and that was that our state had become very reactive to a number of um, different reports that would come out and say, our state's doing great in this, our state is the worst in this, our state is the best in this. Nobody really quite knew what to listen to. Um, immediately upon coming into office, we, we set a vision for education and set some focus areas and chose those reports and those measures and those indicators that we would pay attention to. Um, one of those is our graduation rate. Another great is news about that this week. Great Let, news about that. Let's talk about that. Okay. Right now. Okay. Because it is good news. Mm -hmm. um, um, it's been a goal of yours to have an impact on the state's graduation rates. Mm -hmm. Where do we stand? Yeah, you know, uh, the, the news that came out last week was that 80% of our students statewide are graduating from high school. And give us some context of that. I, I will, um, because that's important. Um, that, that, is great when you look at the fact that we have improved for the last four years. Our graduation rate, rate statewide has improved over the last four years. Over the last two years, we've seen gains in all of our schools that are most in need of improvement, including our reservation schools. Um, we've seen improvements um, over the last two years with some of our traditionally vulnerable groups, like our homeless students, our special ed population, our free and reduced lunch, uh, our free and reduced lunch students. Um, our minorities, and, and that is good news. 
it's incremental growth. And still, when we look at, we only have an 80% graduation rate, which is right about average. Um, that's nationwide, you're nationwide. saying. Nationwide. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's not great news. And so I, I think it's, it's great to say we're growing, the growth is incremental, we're moving the right student groups, but it's most important for us to, to concentrate on the 20% of the students that aren't graduating. So 80% aside, who are those 20%? that are not graduating what and why 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 do they find school irrelevant yeah. so here's what we've learned number one there are a number of students that need a little extra time and um, and we see that in our fifth and sixth year graduation rates but don't have a chance to share that quite as much second of all our focus on career and technical education on college career and military readiness is right on it's it we are spot on um, those are the students that are dropping out of school under No Child Left Behind, which is left behind, literally, um, and has been replaced by Every Student Succeeds, we were very focused on assessment proficiency. We were very focused on all students fitting inside of a box that says they were successful. And under ESSA, and with a focus on career and technical education, we have an opportunity to look at that 20% and say, we have a lot of successful students in there, a lot of students that should be graduating but aren't because they don't find that proficiency box relevant for them. So we are really trying to um, work statewide on building out more career and technical education programs. And you've had some setbacks in this session. We have, we relative have. Relative to that effort. Yes, so one year ago uh, we formed the Wyoming Career Readiness Council. Um, they targeted uh, coding and computational skills or computer science as two areas that we really needed to focus on to build out um, not only our Wyoming economy but, um, but build out uh, that career and technical education crew, not to say that there aren't other career and technical education pathways that are important, but that's kind of the first bite of the elephant that we took, right? So there were a couple of bills this session that would have, um, that would have, have moved that forward, moved, uh, moved that forward in a great way. They were supported by the governor, and, and frankly, as we think about technology as a viable sector in our state, it's pretty tough to be taken seriously by technology companies if we're not taking coding and computer science seriously in school, and if we're not sparking an interest in a future workforce in our schools. So one bill would have added a fourth year of math to a student's queue of coursework, and that fourth year of math could have been coding or computer science. Um, and, and that was defeated in committee, and I mean, it's unfortunate, but it's the way that, uh, it's the way that the cookie crumbles, so to speak. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk about it. Um, I'm grateful to be shoulder to shoulder with a number of legislators as well as the governor um, on this initiative, and we'll keep plugging forward. Um, we also, with career and technical education, have, um, have a plan uh, that is articulated, and one of the main goals is to make sure that we're aligning our workforce data with our education data and really creating a school environment that is more nimble and responsive to our workforce needs in the state through training programs. So that's exciting. Now one career and technical education piece that is very much still in play, uh, actually two, in, um, in the legislature, number one in our accountability bill, um, that would, would honor schools and would reward schools for not only preparing students for college, but also preparing them for the workforce or preparing them for workforce training or the military. Is there some stigma that still is hanging around from the 80s about what career education means? Is that one of the issues that's impeding progress here? You know, it, it is, and it continues to be, um, certainly on a national scale. I think less so in Wyoming, and, and I feel like one of my responsibilities as state superintendent is to really help kind of crush that stigma. And one of the best ways we can do that is with our workforce data. When we see how many jobs in Wyoming exist that don't, don't require necessarily a four-year degree, um, but do require some some rigorous technical training that oftentimes is offered in high school or in partnership with um, with high schools, and uh, so so that's that's one aspect of career technical education stigma that I think we're we're really getting rid of. We can also look at our workforce data and see that our young adults who who have something other than a four year degree um, are are quite prosperous. Uh, there are. are 
sufficient and um, and uh, and great wages, uh, great salaries for students have, who have something less than a four-year degree. And that's certainly not to discount a four-year degree or discount an opportunity that a student with a college degree has to enter those fields. Uh, but we just want to make sure that we continue to kind of crush that stigma around it um, that maybe exists less so in Wyoming than other places. Superintendent, I want to talk a little bit more about the 21st annual edition of the Quality Counts yeah. survey that yeah. ranked Wyoming seventh. Specifically, it gave you grades. It gave you an A minus for or the state, an A minus for school finance, a B minus in chance for success, but a C minus for K twelve achievement. Mm -hmm. There are some issues and issues in this legislative session that might help address that, specifically dealing with virtual education. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about those? Sure. So virtual education has has been a priority, um, kind of an unintended priority, frankly, um, for me. Uh, but uh, but I came into office and probably within two weeks it was on my radar in a big big way. Um, it was an issue that that uh, Wyoming was behind the ball on, quite frankly. And uh, with our connectivity, with our unified network that we have um, in every community, every school across the state, uh, I think we ought to be leading the pack on that. So I, I like to say that no longer should we be thinking about a brick and mortar education or a virtual education, we need to be thinking about a hybrid. That is our world. That's the way that you and I, Craig, um, learn nowadays. We learn face to face. We learn through online um, modalities and, uh, and we need to offer the same to our students. It's also a wonderful way to continue to create equity across our school districts with our AP classes, with um, some unique course offerings that may only have historically been offered in Cheyenne. And just to give some context to that, you've heard that there aren't enough AP classes offered mm -hmm. in Wyoming. Is that accurate? That is that is accurate. Um, you know, we, we look at our rates. AP stands for Advanced Placement Classes. Thank uh -huh. you for clarifying that. We look at our rates of, um, of Advanced Placement uh, test success and and there's a disparity from uh, our, our bigger schools to our smaller schools and we hope to really impact that through virtual or online education um, there's a bill in play right now that would help us to build a strong infrastructure uh, a stronger infrastructure to accommodate that but I will say that as a department um, we've made a number of decisions to come on board with some uh, some some wonderful um, initiatives uh, that, that provide teachers with resources to be able, believe it or not, one of the con or one of the challenges is finding quality content. But we can't have the the conversation about online education without having the conversation about quality edu or, uh, about quality and rigor. So we want to make sure that we increase access to online or virtual education, but that we don't diminish the quality of education or the rigor of education. Um, two or three more issues I want to get to briefly. Mm -hmm. We have about four minutes, Great. Madam Superintendent. Um, there's a bill being considered by the legislature relative to Hathaway Scholarship mm -hmm. to pro perhaps enhance participation in that program. By all accounts, it's a success. Yeah, so this is the 10th anniversary of the Hathaway Scholarship. Um, we made a number of changes this year. Number, number one on our radar was to make sure that we were talking to students and families well before high school about the Hathaway Scholarship Program. Um, in fact, this year we started awarding, and I'll say that in air quotes, the Hathaway Scholarship to our younger students saying, you you are on your on your way to earning the Hathaway Scholarship. We will support you in your journey and we will support your family in this journey. And, um, and really talking about it at a younger age. But at 10 years old, one thing that we discovered was that um, at 10 years old, the Hathaway, the Hathaway Scholarship Program is 10 years old, not the students. And one thing that we discovered was that um, that we had a number of students who were falling through the cracks. And again, it was our career tech ed kids who were maybe going to community colleges and very successful um, and in, in high school, but they weren't completing the success curriculum that's required of the Hathaway Scholarship Program. And so the bill out there, among other things, addresses those students who have, over the last 10 years, not had access to the Hathaway Scholarship, but have been successful in high school and successful in post-secondary. This is the 100th year mm -hmm. anniversary of the State Board of Education mm -hmm. in Wyoming. 
What is your role? What, how do you perceive your role as still a voting member now of the State Board of Education? Yeah, so uh, there was a vote this summer that, um, that maintained the state superintendent's vote on the board. Um, that's encouraging, uh, and that hasn't historically been the case. Um, my role currently as state superintendent is to continue to collaborate with the state board, continue to strengthen that relationship so that the, the state board is, is really that independent voice that makes education policy even stronger. Um, as a voting member um, on the board, you know, I hope to bring that leadership voice to, uh, to the board on a consistent basis. And, uh, and of course, the Department of Education is tasked with carrying out uh, the bulk of the work of the mm -hmm. board. And so uh, we'll continue to do that and, and work hand in hand with them. A couple minutes left. There are teachers that are watching this program this mm -hmm. evening. Some are concerned whether they're going to be employed mm -hmm. in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Some are concerned um, maybe whether some parents, maybe where their children should come into that profession now. What's your message to teachers today? With all of the talk about education and cuts and shortfalls and unknowns, mm -hmm. what's your message to teachers? Well, I think, I think your last note, uh, your last word, um, unknown. There are so many unknowns right now. Um, what I will say is that education continues to be a priority, uh, not only for our kids, um, but for our state. And, um, and we'll continue to uphold that and make sure that it's a priority. Every single district is making difficult decisions. We saw a school close last year as a result of budget cuts. Um, we did see some teacher cuts uh, last year as a result of budget cuts, and we may very well see more. Uh, should that dissuade someone from entering the, uh, the, the profession? Absolutely not. Um, you know, these decisions are, are going to be made, uh, and we do need to recognize a new normal in education, but it doesn't mean that the profession is any less important, and it doesn't mean that our priority on education is any less important. We've got about 30 seconds. Okay. Your biggest challenge in this coming year is? My biggest challenge is really to ensure that our state while we have to talk about education finance and cuts that we continue to talk about all of the wonderful things that are going on in every classroom every day across the state and also that we continue to focus on the programs and the initiatives that we have going on that have nothing to do with funding but have everything to do with student achievement and have everything to do with student success. Superintendent Balo, thank you so much for letting us invade your office for a day. It's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for, for joining us in. on Wyoming Chronicle. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure.